simply the matter, a matter of selecting purely symbolic figures, then you would have gone a long way towards marginalizing the public. And that pretty well happened in the last eight years. Uh, you know, you had somebody who probably didn't know what the policies were. His job was to read the lines rich, written for him by the rich folk, what he's been doing for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, he seems to enjoy it, and he gets well paid for it, and everybody seems happy. Uh, but uh, to vote for Ronald Reagan is like voting for the Queen of England. You know? uh, and uh, that's an advance. I don't really mean this as a joke. I think that's an advance. You know, it's progress in marginalizing the public. Part of marginalizing the public is taking the formal mechanisms of participation which exist and ensuring that they don't lead to a crisis of democracy by being substantive. And what better method can you think of than simply uh, reducing them to the selection of symbolic figures? I think that happened. I think the press has covered it, uh, though they doubtless know it. Uh, but as for George Bush, I think you've got to return to, uh, you know, to a sort of more normal situation. I don't have any reason to believe that there's any hands-off policy. Uh, if uh, there will be the same kind of resort to covered activities that there's been in the past. Uh, when does the government re resort to covered activities? Well, typically when the domestic enemy uh, doesn't allow it to carry out the activities in public. Uh, that's when a government resorts to clandestine activities. Clandestine activities are difficult, complex, expensive. They carry the danger of being exposed. It's much easier and more efficient to carry out violent activities overtly. And uh, a government typically, our government in particular, when it resorts to clandestine activities, it's usually because it's afraid of the public. Those activities are not much of a secret from anybody else. They're certainly not a secret from the victims. They're not a secret from, uh, uh, other, from the various mercenary states that we have involved in it, like the whole stuff in the Iran-Contra hearings. That wasn't a secret to Nicaragua, it wasn't a secret to Israel, it wasn't a secret to Taiwan or Saudi Arabia or Brunei. You know, nobody, it wasn't a secret to anybody out there. It wasn't a secret to the whole array of shady businessmen who were in it to make a buck, like Richard Secord and Albert Hackham and so on. The fact of the matter is it wasn't even a secret to Congress and the media. Uh, as I said, they knew about the contra flights, they just weren't reporting it. Uh, they also knew about the arms sales to Iran through Israel and they weren't reporting it. Uh, they couldn't suppress any of that any longer after a plane was shot down with an American mercenary and after the Iranian government uh, revealed the fact that the national security advisor was wandering around Tehran uh, giving out Bibles and chocolate cakes. <laughs> At that point, you couldn't suppress it any longer, so it became public and then comes a cover-up operation. But the point is it wasn't really secret to anybody much. And I think you can easily document that. I mean, I was, for example, writing about it from public sources throughout this whole period. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the point is you could keep it secret from the public. It was a low enough level so you could keep it secret from the public. And that means the domestic enemy didn't get too uh, outraged over it. Remember that you've got to control enemy territory. And that's what covered operations are for. If the government happens to be committed to activities uh, the violent or terroristic or subversive or other activities that the domestic public, the domestic enemy, will not tolerate, it'll move to covered actions. That's what they're for, and there's no reason to believe that the Bush administration will be any different from others in this respect. Especially, you know, it's in fact, less reason, after all, what's Bush's background? <laughs> Dr. Chomsky, you um, had a statement in the recent insurgent interview uh, regarding the feminist movement that it has had been the most important the actual effects it's had on social life and cultural patterns. If you quote it accurately, it's been a lasting and important movement with an impact on everything. Uh, why is it that not only the left has trouble with, uh, you know, in some ways working with the feminist movement, but perhaps tolerates to what I feel is an unacceptable degree anti-feminist individuals and perspectives within its mix. That's one question, and the second question... Could, could you be more specific about what you had in mind? I mean, well, uh, I, I don't know. That's, that's a tough thing, because I'd rather not go on. Okay. But yeah. uh, another one I'd like to throw out for you is that you are a world-class linguist, and I'm wondering how this kind of blends in or interfaces with your political work. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I mean, uh, the, actually, the issues of feminism, uh, the, uh, the context of that remark was uh, my expression, if I recall correctly, was, my, was an answer to a question of what happened to the movements of the 60s. And there is a propaganda story about this. The story is that the movements of the 60s had all this idealism and so on and so forth, and it all faded, and after that, anybody, everybody's just interested in themselves, and it all disappeared. And I think that's nonsense. I think that's propaganda, and it's, in fact, an attempt to make people feel that they ought to give up. But the fact of the matter, if you look objectively, at least as I look, it seems to me that the movements of the 60s just expanded and grew in the 1970s and expanded and grew even more in the 80s, and they now reach into much wider areas of the society than any, ever before. Uh, groups like this, for example, would not have been around uh, and certainly wouldn't have listened to a talk like this 20 years ago. Uh, but now they do all over the country, and not just in universities, also in you know, small towns and churches and so on and so forth. I think the movement's just expanded. Uh, that's why the Reagan administration was forced into clandestine activities, in fact. Enemy territory was out of control. Uh, but uh, as for the, fem the reason I mentioned the feminist movement specifically is because that's a product of the 70s. And in, in my view, as, I, as you quoted, it's accurate. I think it, in terms of its overall impact, it's probably the one that had the greatest impact on cultural patterns and relations and structures of authority and so on and so forth of any of, any of them, and that's the 70s and the 80s. Now, to get back to your point about the left, uh, a large part of the origins of the contemporary feminist movement were in the left, and they were in reaction to the sexism inside the left. That was a big issue in the late 60s, you know, a big issue, and it was a very emotional and complicated issue. And that was one of the roots of the modern feminist movement. Of course, you know, feminist movements go way back. Uh, and it could be that the left still tolerates sexism and sexist individuals. I'm sure it does. Uh, I, I, if to the extent that it does, that's just something to be overcome, not just on the left, everywhere else as well. I don't see it anything special to do with the left. Hi, my name is Nancy, and I work with the International Socialist Organization. And I just want to start by saying I, like I'm sure many, many, many other people who are here tonight, are deeply indebted to your work. It's been absolutely essential in helping us cut through the kind of garbage that we're faced with every day when we try to figure out what's going on in the world. But I think, but I think there's also, if I can continue, I think there is also a problem in the analysis that I've seen in your works and that you presented tonight, in the sense that I think we can tend to lose the forest for the trees, that you present so many you know, astonishing details about what is wrong with the system and about what is wrong with the media, that we can tend to lose sight of what I think the really key question is, which is why is this control necessary in the first place? And I would submit at least that I think it's because there's antagonistic... I, I got a minute and a half, I swear to God, it's no longer. It's because there's antagonistic interests involved. They didn't talk about milkmaids and dairy... Uh, you know, whatever it was, dairymaids and spinsters and laborers in the 17th century for no reason. It was because they were the working class. And what we see today in this country I think is quite frankly, let's speak bluntly, a ruling class which tries to control a working class population and that's what it's about is holding on to that power. If that's the case then it seems like to me the question that we face is how to organize to change that system, to challenge capitalism and I think in that effort you do a disservice to your listeners and to the people who respect your work when you equate Lenin with Stalinism as blithely as you did tonight. I say that, and I, I think it's also important to point out that that is an unquestioned assumption and also an easy applause getter we saw that you share with the mainstream media. And I think if it were actually that simple, the, co the horrific kinds of measures that even bourgeois historians describe as a counter-revolution under Stalin would not have been necessary if they were all the same to begin with. Now, in short, to sum up, the situation that you have outlined tonight, I think, is extremely serious, and I think it's important that we all take it seriously. What we're talking about is literally the fate of millions of lives around the world, particularly in the international politics that you describe. That being the case, then I think we need a full and a serious and a fair discussion of various different alternatives, not just talking about the horrors of capitalism, but actually how to change it to end this stuff once and for all. Well, I think you made a yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, well, there's several questions there. One is about the discussion of the United States, and I think what I said is approximately what you said, except I didn't use some of that rhetoric. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, you know, which I don't particular, think is particularly helpful to tell you the truth, either analytically or to understand or whatever, but it's the same picture. Uh, John Jay had it straight. The people who own the country ought to govern it, uh, and the people who 